Well, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us uh, to this webinar in partnership with Black Lawyers for Economic Solidarity Network, uh, a new organization and network that is emerging. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about um, Blessing or Black uh, Lawyers for Economic Solidarity Network in the course of the webinar today um, in partnership and hosted by Law for Black Lives. Um, and so my name is Renee Hatcher. I am uh, the director of the newly named uh, Community Enterprise and Solidarity Economy Law Clinic at John Marshall Law School, uh, where we provide free legal services to cooperatives and nonprofits, small businesses, and other solidarity economy uh, enterprises. Um, I'm so excited about our webinar today. Um, we'll have uh, really some fantastic lawyers um, who are doing cutting edge work um, in the Solidarity Economy Network. Um, and so I'm joined today by Dorcas Gilmore, a uh, partner of Gilmore Kandar LLC, um, a Solidarity Economy law firm based out of Baltimore. Um, also joined by Erica Perry, who's the director and co uh, partnerships director of Law for Black Lives. Um, as well as Clark Arrington, the General Counsel for the Working World, and Elizabeth Carter, the Executive Director and Founder of the Urban Cooperative Enterprise Law Center. Um, so what we're hoping to do today is really to have a conversation. Um, what we want to start with is really a, a grounding and framing of the solidarity economy um, and more or less the history of uh, Black solidarity economy practice. Um, and then from there, talk a little bit about some experiences of lawyers who are doing this work um, in Black communities throughout the United States and kind of highlight the importance of it. But also, uh, we want to leave you with a charge to really try to um, get folks more interested in also in claiming and naming this work and uh, talk a little bit about uh, the ways in which you can get involved. Uh, with the Black Lawyers for Economic Solidarity Network towards the end of the um, uh, webinar today. Uh, so again, I'll start just for a few minutes to frame out our discussion and then pass it on to our panelists who will talk a little bit more about their specific lawyering experiences within the Black solidarity economy. Um, and then towards the end, what we'll do is just to kind of draw out some themes and some um, common experiences, um, some observations, and have about 15 to 20 minutes of Q&A in which we're hoping you will engage. Please feel free to start sending questions in the chat box. Um, we'll definitely have time to address them uh, as the webinar goes on. So if I can just get my screen. So I wanted to start, um, again, just by grounding the conversation um, in the historical practices of uh, Black folks, specifically in the United States, in, um, within solidarity economy practices. Um, and I wanted to really start with this quote uh, of Du Bois, um, because even though this was, this was written uh, decades and decades ago now, right? It's still just as poignant today. But this idea that we are currently at a crossroads, right? Uh, the black community is currently at a cross crossroads. Should we go the way of capitalism and try to be individually rich as capitalists or should we go the way of cooperatives and economic cooperation where we and our whole community could be rich together, right? And I think this is so, um, certainly speaks to me in terms of the things that we're seeing in black communities. Um, across the country and some of the folks that I have the opportunity to work with and trying to really understand the ways in which capitalism um, and racism are intertwined and compounding, right? And specifically that uh, Black folks in this country, their relationship to the United States has always been bound up in labor, right? As to whether or not um, we had rights or the ways in which we were exploited and continue to be exploited in the labor market, right? But specifically in thinking about the genesis of slavery and the, um, 
the institution of slavery in the United States and the ways in which uh, black folks were kidnapped uh, from their indigenous homeland and brought to this country in part for free labor, right, to build the wealth of this nation. Right? Our relationship to this country in, in many ways has always been connected to this lo larger idea of the needs of labor within the capitalist system in the United States. Um, and, you know, through, through different points of history as to whether or not, um, you know, black labor was necessary at any given moment, right, was also um, very telling in terms of the way in which we were treated and also the, the legal foundation that was established. Um, and so now, you know, a lot of what um, has brought me to the solidarity economy work is really this idea that what we have to do is go beyond creating individual wealth for ourselves and working with, you know, small business owners that might might make it and um, accumulate a lot of wealth from their business, but that doesn't necessarily always translate to the uh, advancement right, of Black folks as a community or even of the local community. And so really trying to think about the ways in which um, we are participating and also building um, economic solidarity within the Black community. So what is the solidarity economy movement, the solidarity economy um, theory and practice? I just wanted to kind of provide a basic uh, definition as to how I think about the solidarity economy, which there are, are many, but you know, there's some common principles, I would say, certainly across all definitions within uh, sol solidarity economy practice in the US. But at its core, the solidarity economy movement is really just a movement to transform our current dominance a dominant system, economic system, capitalism, into an uh, alternative or different economic system that kind of centers the needs of people and, and uh, the planet, right? So it consists of a number of different kinds of both economic initiatives and experiments in which people are trying to essentially make a different way for themselves, right? To provide for their material needs, um, to infuse democratic practices within not only the economy, but also the ways in which they uh, make community. And so the solidarity economy consists of people's assemblies and community councils and cooperatives and solidar uh, social enterprises and nonprofits and individuals and time banks and different kinds of cooperation and mutual aid um, that we know um, uh, black folks have had a long history of. Um, but more than that, what it really tries to do is try to transform the economic system and put resources uh, from uh, moving from the system of extraction and exploitation to one that is more towards sustainability and more regenerative practices, right? It's trying to address the ways in which power has been concentrated um, and trying to make decision making more democratic. Right. Um, I started to speak a little bit about the ways in which um, black labor has always been exploited in different ways at different uh, points in time of this history. But what we're trying to do with the solidarity economy practice and movement is to move towards a um, collective commitment to solidarity practices, particularly when it comes to our labor. Um, and then also the ways in which culture right, has uh, been, been both used and perpetuated right, around racism, specifically the ways in which black folks have been um, exploited, enslaved, um, discriminated against when they were able to enter the formal economy, um, but then also still marginalized and um, facing different kinds of both exploitation and discrimination in the workplace. And so how do we move the culture to one that is more equitable? Uh, so I, th I always think it's helpful to see a depiction of the solidarity economy, right, and thinking about the different uh, modes of the economy itself in terms of creation, the different ways in which things are produced, um, the, the various ways in which we um, actually exchange value for value or economic activity, uh, the way in which consumption or um, is, and use looks like, right? Um, but all these different things are, are basically the kinds of experiments, the kinds of initiatives and enterprises that currently exist within the solidarity economy, right? They are both businesses and organizations that are trying to make a different way really to 
to provide for the material needs of people and to increase the quality of life of individuals in our communities. So you'll see things like worker cooperatives, which are a large part of the solidarity economy, but really it's so much more broad than that. So there are also right, just various means of exchange like barter clubs, like time banking, um, or the various in ways in which uh, we can reorganize ourselves to ensure that we have what we need, like housing cooperatives or using um, child care cooperatives. Um, but this is basically just the, the a, a depiction of some of the kinds of enterprises that exist within the solidarity economy. Um, again, the heart of it being kind of the needs of people in the planet and sustainability. Um, so one of the things I just wanted to lift up really is that we're very fortunate that there's been so much uh, really rich and wonderful scholarship more recently around uh, the Black Solidarity Economy practice specifically. So Jessica Gordon Nimhard's book is absolutely required reading if you want to, um, to learn more about the history of African American cooperative um, development and thought in the United States. Um, came out in 2014 and, and really what she does is a wonderful job even starting to slavery and really details all the various ways in which uh, black folks in the United States have cooperated or the types of enterprises that they have built over um, you know centuries and and the fact that this is you know deep within our culture and something that for a long time uh, went unrecognized or I think maybe have been forgotten so um, I would definitely recommend folks to check that out. Uh, more recently, there's been the Black Social Economy in the Americas, which uh, is done by a wonderful um, scholar, Caroline Hossein, who really details the um, Black um, economic solidarity practice in the diaspora. And so she's talking about everything from Susus, um, in South America to some of the solidarity and social solidarity economy enterprises in uh, Canada, but talking specifically about the, the things that bind us throughout the diaspora, like this idea of culture and the fact that this, this goes back to um, indigenous practices in Africa right, and was a part, a longstanding part of our culture and made its way as um, the slave trade right, dropped us off at different points, right, still made its way into our practice and into our culture. Um, and then more recently, Monica White um, just published a book about freedom farmers, uh, which is, is a really wonderful book about, um, you know, uh, solidarity economy with the, within the context of uh, farming and agricultural practices in the U.S. So I would definitely um, just recommend that you all spend some time with these if you're interested. Um, but kind of following up on this point is that right? This is a, there's a long history of um, Black solidarity economy practices in the United States, and so I want to shout out to. Um, Cooperation for Liberation Study Group who created this timeline of um, Black cooperative history. This comes out of, again, Collective Courage, one of the books that I just spoke about, Jessica Gordon Nimhart's book. And right, I think this is helpful because it just gives us a continuation of the various ways in which uh, Black folks in the United States have been doing um, cooperatives, doing cooperative development. And I also want to just say that, you know, again, cooperatives and cooperative development is just one small part of the larger solidarity economy network and practices within the Black community. Um, but it also includes, you know, almost every uh, Black political thought leader um, that, you know, we, we talk about and we think about and we uh, look to, I think, for answers now or to inform some of our um, organizing work and some of our thinking today. So everyone from W.E.B. Du Bois to Ella Baker to Fannie Lou Hamer um, to uh, uh, Marcus Garvey, right, all of them were working and furthering the idea of Black cooperative development um, and so I just want to to actually visualize right ever since um, folks were um, brought to this country um, that they have been cooperating right to 
to survive, to meet our material needs, to better our lives. Um, so even thinking about maroon communities, right, in which were runaway slave communities, the ways in which people made community and cooperate to ensure that could happen, and they could set up their own self-sustaining uh, communities and, and societies. But then also, right, there are many stories in which those maroon communities and maroons actually went back and tried to, you know, rescue other slaves who were still enslaved uh, on plantations. Um, so we've been doing this a long time. And, and what I see today is like a continuation of the work that has been happening. Um, so at the core of the solidarity economy, really are these five principles of that um, kind of the foundation of the theory. Uh, so solidarity, sustainability, equity in all dimensions, participatory democracy, and pluralism. So what that means is no matter what you're doing, it's like a commitment to this principles is like the baseline in terms of actual solidarity economy practice. Um, so you can start a for-profit business, you know, as a sole owner, and still find ways in which to incorporate these principles and be within the solidarity economy. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be economic activity. It can also be things like just providing things that people need, right? So it's, it speaks to economic activity, but not necessarily the exchange of money. Uh, people using time banking and other kinds of services are being really creative about the various things that we can do beyond this current capitalist system, right? It's, it's um, kind of key and to the larger right, picture of what the solidarity economy can be. Um, so again, hearkening back to the fact that we've been doing this a long time, I just wanted to lift up a few examples. Um, so right, in thinking about the long history of solidarity between the fight for liberation uh, with black folks and um, Palestinians, right? And so you know, the, there's a logo there from uh, Blacks for Palestine. Um, uh, the, on the upper right hand corner, you see a picture of Bobby Seale from Black Panthers with Cesar Chavez. Uh, they did a lot of solidarity uh, work in California. Um, I think this picture specifically, they were visiting a school, but had a, a long and deep relationship and also were in community with each other. Um, and then finally, on the right um, bottom corner is a contingent of uh, uh, Black Lives Matter at Standing Rock, right, being very clear that we're in solidarity and that the struggles of indigenous peoples are also our struggles and um, showing up and uh, being in solidarity with uh, various uh, groups and social movements. So this idea of equity in all dimensions, right, the second principle of the solidarity economy um, I really wanted to lift up the Combahee River Collective, right, which is, uh, started in 1974, a radical feminist group um, who came out with the Combahee River Collective Statement. Um, if you haven't read it, please read it. It, it really, um, I think, pushed a lot of the thinking and more or less talking about intersectionality, but also talking about then calling for the need to um, take an internationalist approach, right? Uh, centering ourselves and also the struggles of, of third world peoples as a part of the larger black liberation struggle. Um, and most recently, um, Kianga Yamada Taylor just wrote a book about it, uh, which is really great that kind of honors the history, but also incorporates right, some of the current thinking. Um, so would also suggest that. Uh, I also wanted just to um, lift up uh, BYP 100 and some of their organizing work, right? And them being clear that they take a black queer feminist approach to their organizing work. Uh, Charlene Carruthers just recently uh, published a book called Unapologetic that basically specifically talks about this framework of what does it look like to do queer feminist organizing um, for black liberation. Um, so what, uh, again, just suggest that folks like spend time with some of that material as well. Um, but speaks to the ways in which, you know, we are thinking beyond the issues of race, thinking beyond, right, or have to incorporate a larger analysis in liberatory work. Uh, and then sustainability. Um, this picture, uh, the black and white photo is from a uh, sit-in in North Carolina in Warren County uh, where they were trying to stop toxic waste from a landfill that was near a black neighborhood. Um, right, I, I 
often feel like we don't have enough conversations about not just climate change, but also right, the current situation that we're in in terms of our um, relationship with the planet and black communities. Um, so one of the things that I often think about just more recently is like the, the flooding that happened in Houston. We know that the, most of the people who were displaced right, were black folks, like it was specifically a black community that suffered the brunt of the fl flooding that happened in Houston. And that's in part because the, the ways in which community development in black neighborhoods have been both planned and zoned and segregated and redlined for a very long time. And so what we know is that a lot of the, the communities that were hit the hardest in Houston were in a floodplain and they were primarily black folks in part because though at a point that was the only place in which they could buy and they were often right, um, kept out of other points of the city right so we have to constantly think about not only like what's to come we know that we have a lot of work to do and that we're currently not prepared for climate disruption and climate change um, but wanted to give voice to some of the really wonderful work that's happening not only in uh, dealing with climate change as it is now, but um, you'll see in the upper right hand corner, um, that's Jackie Patterson. She runs the NAACP's environmental and climate justice program. She does some really wonderful work um, around the country on climate justice issues. Um, in the left hand lower corner, um, is basically the father of the environmental justice movement um, that we don't necessarily right, really even think about it in the context, I think, of, of uh, Black organizing work. But, you know, there are folks who have been doing this work for a long time. Um, uh, also wanted to uh, big up some, some work that was happening in Baltimore around stopping an incinerator um, which was mostly like based in a black community. So again, our community in part in the United States is one that is typically hardest hit by issues of environment, environmental hazards, as well as thinking about the impending climate change and disruption that's to come. Um, so we, we need to do a lot of the resist work and we are doing that work, but also I wanted to give voice to uh, Soul Fire Farm, um, who uh, just published something called Farming While Black, Soul Fire Farm's Practical Guide to Liberation on the Land. There's also an accompanying book with this, but part of what they talk about are, are um, ancestral practices, right, that can actually regenerate the land, right? We know that so much of the farming industry in the United States is extractive. It ruins the soil. Um, it makes it almost impossible for us to sustain this kind of farming. Um, but what a lot of folks within the Black land movement are doing and practicing really are indigenous ancestral practices that are um, indigenous to different parts of Africa, and they are implementing that in their work um, and in farming practices here. And so, again, just another way in which people are using our history and uh, um, to to survive, right, and and also to thrive in different ways, but to to incorporate the needs of the planet and the, the considerations of the planet. Um, so participatory democracy is the fourth principle of solidarity economy. Um, and I wanted to uh, you know, just speak a little bit to the people's assemblies movements that's going on, particularly in the South uh, with Project South and a lot of the wonderful work that they're doing. Um, so they have been organizing on local and state and regional levels, right? In terms of participatory democracies, really trying to anchor and, and organize folks in a way beyond mobilization, right? So really having deep conversations about what democracy can look like and ensuring that we're engaging with everybody and that they everybody has a, a chance to participate in thinking about the kind of design and shifting that needs to happen to ensure that, you know, low income black folks can actually participate in some of our spaces in part because they are so um, um, it, at least within the system, right? They're often required to spend numerous hours of, at work and not necessarily fully participate in other ways that are just as important. Um, so they've been doing a lot of the infrastructure work around a more democratic process, right? Um, 
and have come up with um, or, or partnered with and People's Movements Assemblies, which has an organizing handbook around People's Assemblies. Um, but I think in a lot of our cities, we're seeing local People's Assemblies that are organized in, you know, in various ways. I know that some of that work is currently happening here in Chicago. Um, but you know, again, this is something that we have and have historically and now uh, are still doing. And finally, the last principle of solidarity economy is pluralism, which is basically, you know, there's no one right way. There's um, always have to consider context in terms of what we're doing on the ground, right? And so I wanted just to um, kind of give some examples of uh, how the solidarity economy has manifested, right? Uh, within the United States. So even going back to uh, 1780 and the Free Afri African Union Society that happened in Rhode Island, uh, which folks kind of came together to form one of the first mutual aid societies uh, within the Black community here in the United States. Um, UNIA, again, like talking um, really about the brilliance and um, the magnitude of what Marcus Garvey was able to accomplish with uh, the UNIA. Uh, down at the bottom, and then give some more recent examples. Uh, Tight Shift Laboring Cooperative is a worker cooperative based in Washington, D.C., um, in which they, uh, most of the worker owners, or all of the worker owners are returning citizens, um, and they're trying to create, right, an alternative structure, right, uh, for work and, and really community. Um, for, for their folks. And then finally, Village Financial Cooperative, which is based in Minnesota, came out of organizing around the uh, Philando Castile murder um, in Minnesota and what the black community decided through a number of different community meetings was that, you know, what they really need is economic independence and, and power. And so they've been working to start a black led uh, credit union for the last year and it'll be launching later this year, which is really exciting. And then finally, I wanted to give voice to, you know, certainly um, one of, I think, my uh, inspirations in some of this work, which is Fanny, Fannie Lou Hamer. And so many people, you know, know about Fannie Lou Hamer and her work with the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, but don't necessarily know about the work that she did with the Freedom Farm Cooperative later in her life um, and established, you know, a, a cooperative, agricultural cooperative that uh, had as, as much as 680 acres of land at one point. Um, they started a pig bank with about 20 pigs that were donated from the National uh, Women's Negro Council. Um, and from there, what they started to do was actually breed the pigs and then donate them to families who, you know, were food insecure. And what they would do is they would give the families an impregnated pig and they would, the families would then have to donate a number of the piglets back so they could continue to you know, provide for more and more folks. Um, so I think at the height of the program, they had more than 200 pigs. Um, but also, you know, the Freedom Farm had a Head Start program, a community garden, a sewing cooperative. Um, they were trying to really identify what the needs were, right, and then create solutions for that that they both controlled and um, could administer, right, the tool bank, um, as well as uh, affordable housing. But these were all things, right, in terms of some of the backlash that was faced by um, uh, folks in the South who were organizing at that time, right? These were the things that they needed to survive. And so, um, you know, I think this is really a, a wonderful and seminal example of Black economic solidarity. And so we're gonna shift now to talk about what role that lawyers play. Um, so there's a number of different perspectives in which you can do this work from a, a number of our, our uh, panelists. We'll kind of talk about the space in which they're currently doing the work, but there's a number of different perspectives in which you can do this work, you know, and, and from uh, community-based lawyers who are embedded in different organizations to folks who are doing movement work and, 
and incorporate solidarity economy strategies into it to transactional public interest lawyers. I, there are lots of needs around the solidarity economy network. And so we'll talk a little bit more about um, uh, the various ways in which lawyers are involved in solidarity economy organizing. Uh, but finally, I just wanted to kind of speak to what this idea of lawyering is in the solidarity economy, right? Um, it's certainly the ideas that we build the capacity of our clients, that we're trying to address the, the inherent power dynamics of capitalism and increase the power of our clients or community, um, that we always need to be clear about the underlying theory of change and lawyering approach that we're using in the work. And then, you know, what I think is, it, why this work can be really wonderful and exciting too is like how do we even start to think about reimagining the law as it currently looks to transform what the economy is specific to black communities um, so there's a number of different approaches that folks take in doing some of this work and i just wanted to um you know kind of speak a little bit to that but i'm going to turn it over now to clark errington to uh talk about his experience as a lawyer in the solidarity economy Greetings. Um, this is Clark Arrington. Um, that was an excellent presentation, Renee. Um, I'm really um, pleased to be part of this webinar, just to, if nothing else, to have heard a consolidation, a, a real um, you know, overview of, 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 of solidarity economy. Let me say, I mean, part of that is that, um, you know, I'm the elder of the group. Um, I graduated from law school in 1974. Um, in the last, um, from 2001 to 2016, I spent in Africa. Uh, when I left in 2001, there was no such thing, to my knowledge, as a solidarity economy. Um, and when I came back, it was um, a flourishing, um, vibrant, energetic, you know, solidarity economy with lots of, no, I won't say lots, but with uh, um, an array of really talented, mission-oriented, young, black, brilliant attorneys um, spearheading and leading and providing, you know, tremendous guidance and information and strategizing to our clients in, in the black communities interested in community economic development. So, um, you know, this is, um, this webinar is just as um, vital and important to me as it is um, to everyone else, even though I'm a very old uh, seasoned Pioneer. I'm just checking in on time. Um, I also teach, and I tend to teach and talk more than what I'm allowed to do. So, um, excuse me. So, what I wanted to do was, um, at least briefly, um, <clears throat> provide a little bit of overview of, of my my career, as well as an overview of um, of the solidarity economy, a movement, to the extent I've experienced it. My involvement is basically very, very intentional. I, I, I rejected capitalism from the onset. Um, even in high school, when I learned, I went to high school in North Carolina, high school called Palmer Memorial Institute. It was a private black school. Um, it was kind of a, an elitish, bougie school. We were feeders to Morehouse, to Hampton, to Spelman, to um, Tuskegee, to University at North Carolina College, et cetera. Um, and, um, you know, I had, a, I had access to black history. I mean, Carter G. Woodson was our history textbook. So I, I learned uh, about slavery and I learned probably about some things in the 60s that most of my colleagues who did not attend black private schools or a black private school learned. And one of the things they learned about was slavery. And it was clear to me that if slavery was the essence and the keystone, the foundation of capitalism, as it was, oh, well, slavery predated, no, capitalism was started with slavery. Then we needed to find another economic model. We couldn't like just rush into capitalism. If, if, if that was the basis of slavery, we certainly didn't want to join a system that was so exploitive that such evil in, intent to it that's, that, that slavery did. And so I was searching for alternatives from a very, very early age. And, um, and I also discovered in high school, Marcus Garvey, and this was in the 60s. 
And what impressed me about Marcus Garvey, which just astonished me, was that he was able to raise millions of dollars during the Depression among Black folk. And it wasn't a charitable, it wasn't a, um, you know, a 501c3. He set up businesses, and I saw these pictures. Some of my classmates, their parents, their grandparents were, were shareholders in, in the Black Star Line, the Universal uh, <clears throat> uh, UNNIA. And um, I saw these pictures of, of like hundreds of Black folk um, around a Black ship. I mean, a Black ocean-going liner. And that just totally impressed me. And I, and I never saw these pictures published, but I saw them privately among my students. So going into college, I, you know, I was real clear that I, I was looking for some, some option, some alternative other than capitalism. At the time, let me just sort of cut to the chase. Um, this was just post civil rights movement and civil rights movement led, led black folk to figure out, well, what's next? We now have achieved our major goal, which is public accommodations, which was, you know, equality and employment and housing and access to justice, at least legislatively. What, what's next on our agenda? We were successful. And coming out of that, that, that inquiry, because um, at the time we're talking like mid 60s, early 70s, we were still a land-based people. Urban did not define who black folk were. Now, if you say urban, it means black. But back in the 60s and 70s, we were still Southern land-based people. And so the, the, the solidarity movement or the alternative capitalistic movement basically began with explorations by former civil rights folk as to how, where do we go from here in terms of land. And that led basically to new communities in Albany, Georgia, um, Federation of Southern Cooperatives in Epps, Alabama, Atlanta, Georgia, uh, and Reverend McKnight um, Community uh, Development Association in Lafayette, Louisiana. Those are sort of the three main institutions, and they all had sort of a cooperative um, aspect to them. So they, they were clearly in line with Du Bois, as, as Renee has pointed out, um, in terms of whether or not we're all going to get rich or whether or not we're just individually going to get rich. But other than that, everybody else was about black capitalism. And the, the, the cooperative solidarity movement within black folk was somewhat isolated. Let me, um, let me cut to the chase. I knew this would be an overly ambitious, uh, optimistic uh, attempt to provide some history, especially after I did a little research. And you guys know, once you do a little research, you're your five minute presentation um, gets shot out of the dark. But we, we somewhat evolved from black capitalism, which what Nixon ushered in, in which we were, oh, my computer's getting ready to go dead on me. Your Mac needs to cool down before you can use it. Ah! I Okay, I think we might have lost Clark. We can see if we can call in. I'll see the number. Okay, maybe while we wait to get Clark back, um, we can uh, move forward. So I'll turn it over now to Dorcas Gilmore. Dorcas, are you there? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, thank you for the amazing overview, Renee. Um, and I hate that Clark got cut short. Uh, it was very interesting uh, to think about our uh, the legacy of this work. And so where I would pick up is to think about how do we continue the legacy and the work of um, our communities and of lawyers specifically, uh, and to think about how can black lawyers and lawyers of color continue to advance this work today. Um, so I wanna talk about it in um, terms of a couple of themes. Um, one, how can we 
um, ensure that we're able to stay in our communities, um, that gentrification is very real um, in cities across the country and black density in urban areas um, remains um, disproportionately where we are physically located. Um, and so how do we think about equitable development and support communities who are not only um, trying to remain where they have been for generations, but to control the land um, and economic opportunities that are now coming um, back since the city is um, now the place that um, this generation and, and future generations want to be. So equitable development um, as one theme. Um, everything takes money. So how do we assist um, clients with um, raising capital and ensuring that we have the funds that we need or close to what we need in order to make uh, the work happen? The third area is really um, forming organizations um, and and forming them in a way that they are not the same as the kind of um, exploitative um, organizations that many of us have been a part of. Um, and how do we think about governance as a um, site of transformation um, in our communities? Um, and then the broader category of just community-driven democratic um, institutions and processes. Um, and so how are lawyers a part of ensuring that uh, democracy at the local level, and I'm not talking about uh, political democracy here, but um, voice in how our communities um, function, how does that actually happen? How is it structured? How does, how is it uh, continued over time, and how do we work with organizations to support them in doing that? Um, so those are the um, categories that I just want to touch on um, briefly and give a couple of examples to talk about the work of um, Black lawyers in particular, um, and I'll use um, some examples of um, my clients um, who've uh, given permission for um, me to talk about what I'm talking about um, presently. So at the beginning of my career, I spent um, some time doing work around equitable development. And so what that looks like in terms of legal work is um, representing a coalition um, that is either a opposed to a development project um, I'm in Baltimore. Uh, and so at the time, the uh, development project was a casino um, development and are trying to figure out even if the development happens how can the community benefit um, after things move forward and so it's it was um, working with the community to think about how do you form a coalition what are the coalition's values how does the coalition operate um, what are the ways in which we stand united around displacement, frankly, um, and the ways in which that um, affects the character of, um, of Black communities. And so that lawyering um, was really around helping to structure uh, the coalition, helping to talk through with the client um, what it means to make decisions together to establish a negotiating position um, with the developer um, or multiple developers in this context. Um, and then ultimately it is about um, crafting a multi-party contract. So that's what it looks like in the equitable development context, like that fighting gentrification, a tool of fighting gentrification is um, has been used in many cities is the idea of a community benefits agreement. Not a perfect tool, um, but a tool uh, to assist communities. Capital raising. Um, so one of the um, most immediate things that you will hear um, if you talk to any community, any nonprofit, any small business, 
um, is that we don't have enough money to do what it is that we're trying to do. And that uh, lawyers have a role to play in that by helping um, their clients um, structure financing. Um, so one of um, the tools uh, that we're working with um, clients on now is how do we think about community capital raising? Um, so smaller dollar um, investments, um, securities that are um, the, the foundation for a portion of um, the capital that the community needs to implement a project. Um, and so that work is a combination of thinking about choice of entity, thinking about um, how uh, the um, total financing works, um, contracts again, um, and then some securities. Um, the heart of a lot of our work um, is what does it mean to be community driven um, and how do you form organizations that are actually different? Um, and so one example of that um, currently is a black arts and entertainment district um, that is again a coalition effort and trying to um, help the coalition to think about structure, um, to think about shared agreements, um, to survey and understand um, what's the best organizational structure for what they're trying to do, um, and then to uh, assist with the process um, of the city actually um, filing the application. Um, and then finally, um, because um, Renee did an excellent job of also bring, bringing up um, climate change and the work around environmental and climate justice, and there's some great work happening in Baltimore. Um, one of the opportunities of doing this work um, is to help um, build the knowledge base uh, in our communities around the variety of tools. Um, so something that I'm working on now with my uh, students in clinic is a climate adaptation finance toolkit. So um, if you are in a coastal community and you have to move or you need insurance, how do you think about getting the funds to actually do that? Um, and what are the range of tools that are possible um, to actually ensure uh, that your community is sustained um, post a disaster or just uh, rising sea level. Um, so those are um, a few examples. And um, I would be remiss to say that uh, addressing the economic position of black workers in the labor market um, should be, I would hope, um, a part of all of our work. Um, and that that takes a variety of transactional and uh, litigation and administrative um, avenues. Um, and just that all of this work, as uh, Renee uh, outlined, can be done in a lot of different practice settings. Um, and I have done this work as uh, in-house counsel uh, for the NAACP, uh, working with nonprofit organizations in my own firm and in a law clinic. Um, and so I would just uplift that it's important for us to think about this work as work that can be done in any practice setting, um, that you don't have to be in a particular place um, or in a particular type of firm uh, in order to do this work. So I'm sure my time is up, um, so I will pause there. Thanks so much, Dorcas. So now I will pass it off to Erica Perry, who will talk about her work. Thank you so much, Renee. And thank you for such a wonderful presentation. Um, I'm just so grateful, uh, <laughs> so grateful to just be among such brilliant, beautiful uh, uh, panelists who are doing amazing and powerful work. Um, and also excited to hear from Clark because uh, you were you were on a. Uh, you were doing some great work. Um, and so um, I'll just talk a bit about Law for Black Lives, our clinical cohort, uh, where we're working to try to meet some of the needs of organizations who are doing work uh, around a solidarity economy. And so um, our clinical cohort um, 
is a one to two semester long program. Um, and it's a partnership between Law for Black Lives um, and like over a dozen law school clinics throughout the country and then national movement organizations. And so our goals for the cohort um, and our objectives are to leverage legal and academic institutions to support the needs of local and national movement organizations. Um, <clears throat> and then also provide opportunities for clinical students and professors to build relationships with movement actors. And so many of them being um, organizations who are doing work in the South and throughout the country um, around land co-ops and uh, land trust to meet and address the needs of like our people. And then we also wanna make sure we're grounding our students um, and professors um, and building relationships uh, with them and grounding them in a theory and practice of movement lawyering, which is one of the like practices that we think can help really like work and collaborate with uh, organizations who are doing this work. And then also making sure we're grounding them in what it means to be in practice in a solidarity economy um, and like being stewards of lands. Um, and then we also wanna make sure we are co-developing resources um, to support these ongoing campaigns and work to build alternatives outside of the system. And so some of this work includes research, policy and data analysis, popular education and model legislation. We've been doing a lot of mapping of, of state laws and local laws to try to figure out what's actually possible um, under the current system. And then also trying to really push our students to be innovative and like thinking about like actually what can I do that exists like uh, how can I be innovative about my approach to the law so that we can make it possible to like actually actualize some of the dreams uh, of our of our movement partners. And then I think also um, uh, we're also developing a program for our professors and students uh, that provides them again a political education around the theory and practice of movement lawyering and then as well as the context of theory around the research topics. And so it's been really important for us to give students an opportunity to build relationships with like movement actors like the National Black Food and Justice Alliance. Um, so the students understand the values and the principles uh, around this type of work. Um, and then again, where uh, I think another uh, a huge part of it is to radicalize law students, right, so that they become anti-capitalist abolitionists who are really working and striving to build this vision of a world that we think will actually make us more free. Um, and so I'll just name some of our movement partners who were like actually extremely grateful to be working with and be in service to and collaborating with. And so that includes the National Black Food and Justice Alliance, uh, Southeastern African American Formers Organic Network. Seeding Resistance, uh, the Blackout Collective, and Picture the Homeless. And so um, and these are uh, organizations, partners that are like spread throughout the country, um, from New York all the way to like Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, North Carolina. And so um, again, this is an opportunity for our students to really engage in movement lawyering and work in to provide resources uh, where they uh, both in practice and then like uh, developing a deeper understanding of the values and principles of a solidarity economy from the people who are actually doing the work um, on the ground, who are like trying to figure out how we meet the needs of our people and like build um, build alternatives for our folks. And so um, I think in the, the minutes that I have left, I'll just like kind of like talk a bit about some of the questions that we've been working on um, for the past like year and a half. Um, because this is our third semester and so we started uh, last January. Um, and so we've been looking at with our students, um, with our movement partners at, at to answer questions of like, what are the legal options for a black farmer to place family owned land into a community land trust or, or nonprofit uh, dedicated to providing black farmers and organizations access to land. Um, and then around the question of land and, and stewarding the land, we've been asking questions around like, or trying to like figure out what would be a model lease for farmers uh, who are engaged in this type of work. And then to address the issue of like affordable housing, uh, we've asked, um, I've been asking questions around like, uh, researching uh, community land trust and co-ops for clients who uh, want to start an eco village. Um, uh, um, or another form of affordable housing or community driven rather affordable housing project, um, including uh, and in that keeping in mind like how we would make it available available for returning citizens. And then also we've asked the question of um, trying to figure out what policy and litigation options um, that uh, 
would make sure that people who are experiencing homelessness can take advantage of community land trust. When the community land trust, um, a policy of the community land trust as it stands, um, requires uh, people who are applying to the specific uh, program to have an already existing address and a job. Um, and so we're trying to figure out innovative ways to like make sure our people's needs are being met um, and, and address these systemic barriers. And then also I think as we, uh, as Renee spoke about, there are a number of issues that we, we know that we can address and solve uh, with our people through like solidarity economies and so we've been trying to figure out how community land trusts uh, can address a number of major problems facing the black communities related to land so really thinking about food deserts um, and entrepreneurship opportunities for people who are who are returning citizens um, and gentrification and displacement um, and then specifically our students looked into a question of like actually answering the question of like what assistant or assisting with the study of what kind of supports would uh, citizens who are returning, uh, returning citizens would need to actually engage in entrepreneurship. Um, and so that's just a bit of the work that we've been doing over the past year to try to both like resource our movement partners, uh, collaborate with them and both radicalize students um, and use the resources that exist within these institutions to serve our people. And so I pass it back to Renee. Thanks so much, Erica, for that. Um, fantastic, so I will pass it to uh, Elizabeth Carter, last but certainly not least. Uh, Elizabeth, are you on? Yes. Okay. Great. Okay. So, hello, everybody. Um, it's good to see some familiar faces, uh, folks from Law for Black Lives, as well as the State of the Economy's Law Center. I've been fortunate to be a fellow of both organizations. And so, today I would like to just share with you all. Um, a project that I've been working on since 2016. Um, and this project is called the Urban Cooperative Enterprise Legal Center. Um, the motivation for this project actually stemmed from my dissatisfaction with both my urban planning studies and my legal studies. Um, I, although great, you know, I'm a lawyer, right? I, I learned a lot in the law, I learned a lot in urban planning, but I also recognize some limitations in terms of their ability to um, be effective uh, as far as the traditional methods to be effective in urban communities or black and brown marginalized communities. Um, and so I just, I just challenged it a little bit. I was challenging the, 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 the different studies and I wrote in law review article, um, which was published in the Southwestern Law Review, um, part of their class crits, um, I guess, uh, presentation that they had a couple years ago. And what it did is just challenge uh, the traditional methods of the law as well as urban planning and its ability to, um, again, actually create change in communities that are with limited resources. And so from there, that article created a foundation for the nonprofit um, USOC for short. And really, the nonprofit is based upon uh, the rebellious lowering principle by Jared Lopez. Um, Jared Lopez, I was uh, you know, very inspired by his work of uh, this multidisciplinary approach to the law. And even though back then how early his thinking was, um, I recognized myself that, you know, in order to create any, I guess, real change to the status quo, as an attorney, I had to understand that the law is very limited to do that. And therefore, we need to connect with other disciplines um, in other groups and communities and organizers, everybody, you know, that are um, affected by or somehow involved in the communities that we're engaging in to create this, again, multidisciplinary approach to creating alternative systems. Um, and so where I am now with the project, um, because we're, it's, it's composed of all volunteers at this point, and because we're conscious of being grassroots and to really create from the bottom up, we're sort of working and breaking in into different mini projects. So our original uh, project or program was um, to start a co-op academy, a cooperative academy. And we found that that was sort of jumping ahead a little um, in a sense that we're in New Jersey, I should say, um, and we're specifically in, in Newark, New Jersey. And unlike cultures like New York City or, in, or Oakland, California, the solidarity economy or the cooperative economy it's not necessarily a huge popular thing. And so where we are, we have to really create that 
alternative, um, so to speak, for the individuals that live here. So what we try to do with what we're doing with the street team, and which is why the pilot or education program wasn't the best thing to do because that academy requires folks who are already interested, have some basic knowledge of, of what a cooperative is, what is a land trust, and are ready and committed to learn much more and a deeper scale, and then at the end, create this enterprise, right? And so we found that that was jumping ahead, and what we needed to do instead was actually mobilize the broader community and connect with those who are, are fighting similar fights, whether it's you know affordable housing, anti-justification efforts, uh, reentry efforts, uh, prison, you know, prison rights efforts and say, hey, you know, we're very interested in the same issues because we recognize that these issues all interface with one another in our neighborhoods. And so how do we connect with you? How do we build with you to um, bridge that gap? Um, in other words, if you're a tenant organizer and you are interested in affordable housing, we will connect with you through the street team to create um, or to build um, that, that gap and to create possibly a housing cooperative of those tenants. Um, and so share the same cohort that we're looking at. Um, so now where we're at with the team is building the foundation for the team because also one of the goals and aims for the organization is to have self-governing um, projects. So the street team will be self-governing, the planning team will be self-governing. And that actually uh, was, is modeled after the Sustainable Economy Law Center, a holacracy governance model. Because we also understood that, or I understood when I, I was drafting or thinking of this idea that in order to, to it's not enough, and this is actually what Jared Lopez was arguing as well, it's not enough to go in the community and say, I'm going to create change when your organization or your um, platform itself does not mimic that. And so we as well want to become cooperative um, in our decision making and our um, governance. And so we're building that same model um, so that those who are on the forefront, i.e. the street team, gets to govern itself and how it's going to run with, of course, um, you know, with the same mission of the organization and the foundation. But the idea is to um, implement this holacracy model so that the organization can be self-run by the individual uh, projects. And so, like I said, right now we're focusing on the street team project. We, we had a pilot for about a year. We had a consistent of 20 organizers from a variety of disciplines. Um, including those who are, had experience in uh, tenant organizing, in prisoner rights organizing, reentry issues, gardening, um, um, youth organizing, artists um, in the local community. And we all were brought together to really study, strategize, and engage with one another um, around the issues that the communities current, currently face. So we, it took some understanding of the broader political economy, of course, and then also um, we were intentional in our studying the certain techniques um, within the solidarity economy and approach to building cooperatives and, and other enterprises. And also being very intentional as to how we engage the broader neighborhoods in order to create this momentum. And once again, create a cohort for, um, for the, the uh, the cooperative uh, atmosphere, so to speak. Um, so that's where we are now. And I will say that I would want to quickly just touch on, I guess, as a lawyer in the solidarity economy who decided to go through the nonprofit route, some of the limitations that are or restrictions in, of the traditional legal system that we, we recognize in this model. Um, first and foremost, um, you know, the malpractice insurance requirement, which makes it complicated because we're, although with the legal uh, the, the legal support that we intend to uh, provide is primarily transactional. It can be very diverse, right? It can be, it can range from, again, business law to um, nonprofit support to um, securities law. And so we, it's, the traditional law hasn't quite caught up with that multidisciplinary uh, support, as well as, it, you know, where we work with other non-attorneys and there's restrictions under the rules of professional conduct as to how to engage and work with non-attorneys in the same law practice. And so we're recognizing that the traditional legal field has not caught up with our approach to um, lawyering in the Saudi economy. Um, and so we're still thinking of ways to, to, to circumvent or to still move forward despite these limitations, because we recognize that the model that we have is just simply a tool. 
because the main goal is to again create self autonomous communities that are, are um, sustainable in the long run. And that is all I have for you guys tonight. Thanks so much for that, Elizabeth. Um, so I kind of want to maybe have just some dialogue really quickly. Also, folks should feel free to uh, add or uh, if you have questions, send them through the chat box. Um, and I think I think it's possible if you're on the phone, we can also unmute you for questions. Um, but I kind of wanted to pick up on this point that Elizabeth let, um, left off on and, and also maybe pull Clark back into the conversation if he's still on. Uh, around kind of the ways in which the law has yet to catch up with some of the things that we see on the ground that communities are doing or trying um, and how that speaks to really the need for lawyers to be involved in solidarity economy organizing and practice. So if Clark's still with us, maybe he can speak a little bit to that and what has been his experience in solidarity economy lawyering. Yes, I had a, I had a lot more to say, but um... My computer for the very first time shut off because it was overheated. And I don't know, that probably meant I was overheating it. But nevertheless, I think I had about two minutes left. And I'm going to try to use maybe less than two minutes to just summarize three or four points that I think are very important. First of all, um, Renee, I think you gave some real meat and detail to what the solidarity economy is. But in very short words, in the short term, it's really about adding value to how we deal with economics. It's adding, taking our values to our economic approach to trade, to commerce. And the first people to really do that um, were basically feminists. I mean, you can say in some regards that, you know, economic solidarity is really a feminist approach to, to economics. Um, and that would start with the Adrian Dominican uh, nuns of Adrian, Michigan, who were certainly the most prominent group to say, we're not going to invest our money in businesses that do not reflect our social values. And in the 1960s, that was kind of a big deal, because that meant if your values were you wanted plurality, you wanted gender equity, you wanted health, you wanted racial participation, et cetera, you were very limited to who you could invest in. But the Adrians were very strict with that. And through the group called the uh, Interfaith Center for Corporate Responsibility, they began having discussions and dialogue about what a, a value-driven economy would look like. So I think it's important to recognize um, the Adrians as um, the first group of uh, investors, really, um, business people, to reflect solidarity economy. Secondly, I think you have to talk about Leon, Leon Sullivan, who in Philadelphia, he was not necessarily a, um, a solidarity economy person as much as he was a community economic development person in the spirit of Marcus Garvey. And what impressed a lot of people, especially me about Sullivan, was that he raised millions of dollars in a nonprofit that he ultimately used to convert into a for-profit or create for-profit subsidiaries by raising $10 a month for 36 months, which were deposited in a, chair, in a bank that he was then able to leverage. But secondly, most importantly with Leon Sullivan, he came out during the apartheid era with the Sullivan principles, which basically said, in order to do business in South Africa, you had to meet certain principles. And that was a major global statement. And this was a man who was on the board of directors of General Motors to say to corporate America, you must have some values in how you do business, and we're going to start with South Africa. Um, thirdly, the, the unit that sort of led folk into, backdoored us into community economic development was the Community Development Corporation, which in the 60s was this community-owned, community-controlled, community um, govern co corporation that supposedly was going to address the needs of a community by creating enterprises that sustain themselves from the community. So you created businesses whose profits would then be used for education, for housing, for um, employment training, etc. And that was um, that started in the 
in the 60s, basically um, Robert Kennedy, Rosie Greer, uh, the Ford Foundation, Franklin Thomas, who was a lawyer, uh, were instrumental in setting up the community development corporations. And then last but not least, my own little journey took me from um, worker co-ops, which I learned in the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, to the ICA group in, in, in Boston, Mass., where I learned about worker ownership, internal capital accounts, um, to fair trade, I helped set up equal exchange and deepen my understanding of solidarity economy by understanding how fair trade played a role. Then to Africa, I went for 15 years. Coming back, I learned about community land trusts, and now I'm learning about non-extractive financing. So I now have a pretty comprehensive package of skills that lead me to be you know, fairly productive in, in advising people about solidarity economy tactics and strategies. So I'm really sorry about the interruption. I had a lot more to say, but um, this has been an excellent webinar and Renee and Dorcas and Elizabeth, uh, great participation and I'm planning and thank you for allowing me to, to, to contribute. Thanks so much, Clark. Um, no, I, I think that's really helpful to understand like the the genesis and different moments um, in which you know you've experienced uh, both in your practice, right, and also in development of solidarity economy. Um, so, Dorcas, did you want to maybe speak to? You talked about three specific you know, issues. I, I feel like that uh, solidarity economy lawyering can address. Um, can you maybe speak to the ways in which um, you found limitations to some of those strategies that you mentioned? Um, and so Elizabeth uh, highlighted some of this, but that the form itself um, often taking a nonprofit form um or a a c3 uh 501c3 form um is is a huge limitation um in terms of movement lawyering um and the movement work that folks are trying to do um and so thinking helping um folks to think about um what are the range of options um and not um simply defaulting to a c3 um, structure uh, when we want to be uh, politically advocating for our freedom and uh, self-determination like what what that might look like um, so I would say the the nonprofit form itself um, or what most folks think of as a nonprofit form um, is is pretty limiting um, and um, a challenge that we we have is kind of what does it really mean to be community driven um, and what are what are our um, images of that so for example um, working with um, public funds um, this is the example of uh, Baltimore Children and Youth Fund um, so it's a publicly financed um, annual uh, allocation from property tax revenue, um, minimum $12 million um, annual fund. And the goal is for the fund to be governed by community members and that community members actually decide, um, and youth being a large percentage or a majority of them, deciding how the funds are spent. In that process, what does it look like to utilize a, a people's assembly model um, in this kind of public finance um, and, and think about what does it really mean to be community driven? Like who is the community? Um, and so our, um, even within our own communities, our views of like how we think about um, who should have a voice. So in a youth fund, should young people um, be 
most of the the decision makers in terms of um, where money goes and and who actually uh, benefits from this public revenue that that has been a challenge um, thinking about and getting consensus on um, you know who decides um, and I think those kinds of questions um, have have been at least um, in my work I've seen as um, both a challenge um, and an opportunity. Thanks so much for that. I think that kind of speaks to like some of the difficulties and, and the challenges I think of of re reframing so much of what has been right and rethinking the ways in which people can participate, but also how do we set up uh, organizations or enterprises that speak to you know radical democratic participation. Um, I think those are like just struggles and challenges that come up in the process. Um, so what we want to do with the time remaining, I think, is, is really to speak a little bit more about what the Black Lawyers Economic Solidarity Network is, really to um, you know, raise a call for lawyers to get involved with this work and also maybe speak to how that can happen. Um, so the Black Lawyers Economic Solidarity Network is just a, a, an emerging network of lawyers who have been uh, meeting on a regular basis, right, to talk about some of the challenges that we see with our work, but more importantly, really trying to build some kind of support network and institutional expertise for a lot of the complex legal issues that come up while in practice in the solidarity economy. And so talking about issues of, you know, finance that uh, might be more on the complex side as, you know, both, um, I think, a number of different um, initiatives and enterprises are looking to uh, incorporate community-based um, capital. So actually, you know, doing kind of crowdfunding uh, through community members in different ways, as well as other types of finance into the incorporation of their structures. Um, but two things like, you know, the various ways in which um, exchange can be um, uh, incorporated or or um, agreed to within different kinds of enterprises and so what we've been doing is really having kind of um, regular phone calls about some of the um, things that we're thinking through in our own works in terms of the law uh, i think you know, one of the wonderful things about this work is that there are so many gray areas right of the law in part because I, the the means of economic exchange within the solidarity economy are fundamentally different. And what that requires, I think, is at least some, um, you know, legal support and um, uh, in, in terms of rethinking how can we, one, use what the status quo actually says, how do we use the law as it currently stands, but how do we actually start to think about pushing the, the boundaries and the edges of the law in terms of law reform projects or um, just different ways in which we can kind of push at the edges as, you know, our clients are um, trying to navigate the various gray areas of what they're trying to do because it is innovative, because it is trans, you know, transformationally different than what traditional enterprises look like. Um, so what we would like to do is to uh, send around uh, both the survey after this call as well as an invitation for folks to join uh, the Black uh, Lawyers Economic Solidarity Network uh, what we intend to do in a couple of weeks, and we'll be sending this out after the webinar, um, is to have a, a phone call just really for introductions, but then also to talk about some of the work, uh, some of the work that we might do together, some of the ways in which we can continue to build out a support network, um, and the things that, you know, we see is necessary to continue to do this work and build it out and bring other lawyers into it in a way that's, um, you know, helpful and enriching to all of us. Um, so Clark, with that, uh, Erica, Dorcas, Elizabeth, would, is there anything else you'd like to add before we get ready to close out in maybe the last five minutes or so in terms of the, the network or? No, thank you so much. It's been amazing uh, to both hear about the work that other folks are doing and to just be able to um, be in community with y'all. And folks can learn more about our work at lawforblacklives.org.
and we're excited to be in solidarity with you. Great, fantastic. Well, thank you all so much for participating. Um, we hope to, you know, again, be in contact um, after the webinar and we'll be sending around some information about the Black Lawyers Economic Solidarity Network. And thanks so much to all of the participants, to Clark, to Erica, to Dorcas, to Elizabeth, um, and the attendees, and to Law for Black Lives for, for hosting the webinar. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>